Krishna Krishna Hare Hare. This morning we were reading from Brahma Samhita in the temple about Yoga Nidra. Nidra means sleep. Yoga Nidra is also another name for Yoga Maya. Yoga Nidra is described in Brahma Samhita. Okay. Welcome to all of you. I'm just going to bring up the document. I should have brought it up before we started, but I didn't. We're going to continue with our discussion on Yoga Maya. We are reading from a document, and I just want to tell you how many pages this document is. This document is now 47 pages. This is the document we began reading on the topic of Maya. I don't remember when, but <laughs> it's probably, I think, since the lockdown, we've only really discussed two topics. One, we did a series on death, and that went on for a very long time. And so we've been giving classes, I think. I think it was started in April. So we must have spent five months on the topic of death, and now we must have spent four months on the topic of Maya and Yoga Maya. So it's it's quite interesting to, to go deeply into one topic. I find it extremely valuable. So, on that happy note, we're going to have Kirtan. Kirtan also allows all of you who are late to come. <laughs> Sometimes I might say something very, very valuable right in the beginning and you miss it. I've been starting class late, so everyone's thinking, oh, he's going to start late, so what's the problem? That is true. I have been to the moment. Hare Krishna. I have to um, follow in Prabhupada's footsteps. He would... Um, Prabhupada would not wait for everyone when it was time for the morning walk. He would just go, whether they were ready or not. Okay, I'm going to turn towards you a little bit. Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Kupijana Balabha Govinda, 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 Govinda. Radha Madhava. Hmm. I dropped some. Radha Madhava Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Prabhupada said this song will take us to Vrindavan. In our meditation. Hari 
Vukti Janavalava Giri Bharat Tari Vukti Janavalava Giri Bharat Tari Chishodhanandana Najajana Ranjana Shuranandana Rajajana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Vana Chari Jamuna Tira Vana Chari Adama Nava Punjabi Vijana Balava Girivana Dari Vijana Balava Girivana Dari Shuranandana Rajajana Ranjana Shuranandana Vajajana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Vana Chari Jamuna Tira Vana Chari Radhamana Radha Madha Ma Kunjabi Hari Radha Madha Ma Kunjabi Hari Gopi Jana Balava Hiribana Dari Gopi Jana Balava Girivana Dari Chishodhananana Vajjajana Ranjana Chishodhananana Vajjajana Ranjana Chishodhananana Vajjajana Ranjana Chishodhananana Vajjajana Ranjana Chishodhananana Vajjajana Chari Jamuna Tira Vana Chari Radha Madhava Punjabi Radha Madhava Punjabi Hi. 
Hare Ramo Hare Ramo I go permanently, hurry, hurry, boy. Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamani Namaste Shara Shati Deve Gauravani Tacharine Yavise Sasanivari Paschatine Satarine Anchakapa Turubhyas Chakra Pashinda Veva Chapa Titanam Pavane Vyo Vaishna Vyo Namo Namaha so we left off reading from mm, I don't have the reference where we left off but uh, we left off reading Krishna book chapter 86 and then we read a quote following that about people asking if you've seen God. I don't know if we actually read this. So let's read this anyway. And unfortunately, I don't know where this is from. I didn't make a note of it. This is, um, must be a lecture. People sometimes ask, have you seen God or can you show me God? Sometimes we meet these questions, so the answer is yes. I am seeing God. You can also see God. Everyone can see, can see God. But you must have the qualification. Suppose something is wrong with a motor car. It is not running. Everyone is seeing it, but a mechanic sees it differently. He's qualified to see it with greater understanding. So he replaces some missing part. And immediately the car runs. But although for seeing a machine we require so much qualification. We want to see God without any qualification. Just see the folly. People are such rascals, they are such fools, that they want to see God without their imagined qualifications. So, I don't believe in God because I can't see him. Excuse me, sir, are you qualified? It's not that God reveals himself to everyone. So, you have to have some qualification. No, God should show himself to me. If he wants me to believe in him, he should show himself to me. 
Hmm. No, it doesn't work that way. So that's uh, that's a problem. Yes, actually, he is showing himself in his in Bhagavad Gita in the deity and so forth, but. Even they're seeing, they're not seeing. He's showing himself in the sun. You see the sun, that's the eye of God. Prabhasmi sashi soyel. You see the moon, that's the eye of God. Uh, no, I want to show, you show me God. Okay, we show you this little blue boy. No, that's not God. Oh, you you don't believe in God. Well, what God don't you believe in? Let's continue reading. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Naham Prakasha Sarvasya Yoga Maya Samabrataha. 725. This verse has come up repeatedly in this discussion. I am not exposed to everyone. My energy, Yoga Maya, is covering me from their vision. So, how can you see God? But this rascaldom is going on. Can you show me God? Have you seen God? God has become just like a plaything so that cheaters advertise some ordinary man by saying, here is God. Here is an incarnation of God. What's the example Prophet gave? You want to buy gold? You don't know what gold looks like. So I say, here is God. How will you know? You don't know who is God. So you'll say, no, this isn't God. How will you know? Because you don't know, then somebody shows up and says, I am God. And you say, oh, he's God. Na mam duskritena mudha prapadyante nara damaha. Damaha. 7.15. Sinful rascals, fools, the lowest of mankind, they inquire like that. Can you show me God? What qualification have you acquired by which you can see God? Here is the qualification. Touch chadadana munaya. So this is interesting. You have to have faith. Chadadana means faith. People will, you know, that's the problem. They can't see because they don't have faith. They want to see to get the faith. And we say, through faith, you can see. And they say, no, seeing is believing. And we say, believing is seeing. You first have to believe before you can see. No, no, I only believe when I can see. But you have to believe to see. No, no, show me. So, one must first of all be faithful. Shuddhadhana. One must actually be very eager to see God. Not that one takes it as a frivolous thing. Can you show me God? Or as some magic. They think God is magic. No. One must be very serious and think, yes, I have been informed about God, so if there is a God, I must see him. In other words, what Prabhupada is saying, well, one, you have to be qualified. Two, you have to have faith. And then here, you learn about God and you become anxious to see him. Not that, you know, well, I'm in a... You know, I'm just going to wait for God to reveal himself to me. And then I'll believe him. No, you should be anxious to find the ways and means to see him. You should be anxious to see him. So Prabhupada tells a story. This is a lecture. In fact, I was at this lecture. Uh, Well, maybe Prabhupada told this story more than once, but I heard this story. Prabhupada was laughing when he told this story. I heard this story directly from Prabhupada. There is a story in this connection. It is very instructive, so try to hear. One professional reciter was publicly reciting Srimad Bhagavatam, and he was describing that Krishna is very highly decorated with all kinds of jewels when he tends the cows in the forest. So, there was a thief in that meeting, and he thought, hmm, Why not go to Vrindavan and plunder this boy? In other words, steal his jewels. He's in the forest with so many valuable jewels. I can just go there and catch him. Take the child 
and trick him and take the jewels. That was his intention. So he was serious. I must find this boy, he thought. Then, in one night, I will become a millionaire or more. And Krishna has a million dollars worth of jewels. No, I didn't know they were that valuable. Uh, so the thief's qualification was his feeling, I must see Krishna, I must see Krishna. That anxiety, that eagerness, made it possible for him to actually see Krishna in Vrindavan. Now you're thinking there, you're sitting there and you're thinking, wait a minute, he wants to see Krishna for the wrong reason, and that's true. But Prabhupada's point is, somehow or other, if one's eager to see Krishna, that's the qualification. So, he met Krishna in Vrindavan, and he said to Krishna, you're a very nice boy. He began to flatter him, because he thought, well, if I flatter him, I'll get the jewels. And Then he asked him, he said, you know, you're really rich. Can I take some of your jewels? Krishna said, no. My mother will be angry. I cannot give them away. You know, Krishna knew what he was up to. He's playing with him. And this just made the thief more eager. So now he's dealing with Krishna. He's becoming purified slowly. Then Krishna said, okay, you can take them. <laughs> and then the thief became a devotee on the spot because he'd become purified by Krishna's association. So Prabhupada ends by saying, so somehow or other you should come in contact with Krishna, then you'll be purified. So th this principle is sometimes confusing because we're not supposed to take something from Krishna. This person took something from Krishna, or at least that was his intention, and he benefited, became, became a devotee. So you have this verse in Bhagavatam, a kama. If you have no desire, or sarva kama, you have all desire, Akama, sarva, kamava, moksha, kama, or you desire, not sarva, karma, sarva, kama, desire, moksha, kama, that means the desire, the desire for liberation. So, akama, no desire, sarva, kama, all desire, or moksha, kama. Then it says, tivrena, bhakti yogena. Whatever your desire is, you should take to devotional service Tivrena very strongly. So, now this is confusing because we have heard repeatedly that we should not desire anything from Krishna. Only we should serve him purely and that's the definition of pure devotional service. Our motive should be to satisfy him and that is true. And it appears to contradict the verse because the verse is saying you might have desire, fact, in fact, you might have all desire, and you might want liberation, and you should serve Krishna. So Prabhupada explained it. And exactly what happened in this, this story is Prabhupada's explanation. He said, well, if you want something, you could go to a demigod, or you could engage in some kind of karma kanda activity, some ritual, some puja, and so forth. Or you could work very hard to accumulate wealth or whatever it is you want. Or you could go to Krishna. And we say, no, but this is bad. You shouldn't go to Krishna. And Prabhupada said, but if you go to Krishna, at least you're in contact with Krishna. And when you're in contact with Krishna, you become purified. And so sometimes Prabhupada would tell this story in relation to this verse. And so it would make sense. Now, if you're already a devotee practicing, that verse really isn't for you because you've already done it. You've already come to Krishna. So because you might use that verse and say, well, this means I, I should pray to Krishna to fulfill my material desire. Well, that's actually an offense to the holy name. If you chant the holy name with the intention of fulfilling a material desire, it's one of the ten offenses. But if you're not a devotee and you do it, at least you're coming in touch with Krishna and you become purified. 
from from the state you're in and the consciousness you're in, you'll become purified. But once you take the bhakti, it's not purifying you. It's an offense. So that's interesting. That some things some things for devotees are offenses, which for non devotees are not. For example, you may meet someone and say, Can you say Hare Krishna? And then you might think, well, I shouldn't ask him to say Hare Krishna because he's not a devotee. He doesn't know who Krishna is and he'll make an offense. Maybe he doesn't believe in Krishna. Or maybe he'll just jokingly say it. But if you go to the Bhagavatam, you find that if someone jokingly says Krishna, as, as they used to joke, it's, it's kind of, I guess it's a kind of an eternal phenomena that people of other religions, faiths, Sometimes joke with devotees, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Rama, 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 Hare Krishna. And so that was happening in Mahaprabhu's time and happening in Bhagavatam's time, in the stories of Bhagavatam. So Bhagavatam says even if you joke when you chant, it's called Nama Bas, it's the second stage. But if a devotee jokes, it's Nama, it becomes an offense. Because you know what the holy name is, you know how to approach it, and you know it's no joke. But for them, they don't know. And so, because they're saying it in ignorance, it's not an offense. It's Nama Bas. It's the second stage. And so they benefit by saying it. They become purified. So that's the point. What may be useful or beneficial for a non-devotee, for a devotee, <laughs> it becomes an offense. So that's important. Otherwise, you might read something and think, well, you know, look at this story, you know. I want to see Krishna. I want to get something. You know, I'm going to go to the temple today and ask the deities for a million dollars. Well, maybe you can ask for a million dollars. I, I actually need a billion. I, I calculated I need a billion. Well, I could start with 50 million. You can ask for it if it's for devotional service. I want to start a devotional community. And and I want to build like fifty houses, a big a big temple, big retreat center, and then guest facilities. So I figure I need fifty million. I never actually asked the deity for it. Maybe I should. But if you if you ask Krishna for something for his service, that's totally different. Okay, so this lecture continues. The gopis, gopi, the gopis are another example of great eagerness to see Krishna. The gopis came to Krishna being captivated by his beautiful features. They were young girls and Krishna was so beautiful. Actually, they were lusty when they came to Krishna. But Krishna is so pure that they became first class devotees. Well, specifically, you may know the story of Kubja. Kubja, actually, her desire for Krishna was not pure. It was tainted by material lust, but she became purified by Krishna's association. Sometimes it said the gopis are lusty, but actually, they were, their lust was pure. But anyway, Prabhupada's using this as an example. We can say the gopis were lusty. Definitely Kubja was. Actually, they were lusty when they came to Krishna, but Krishna is so pure that they became first-class devotees. There is no comparison to the gopis' devotion because they love Krishna with heart and soul. This is the qualification. They love Krishna so much that they didn't care for family or reputation when they went out in the dead of night. Krishna's flute was sounding and they were all fleeing their homes. Their fathers, their brothers, their, husband, their husbands all said, Where are you going? Where are you going in the stead of night? But the gopis didn't care. They neglected their children, their family, everything. Their only thought was, we must go to Krishna. So, um, don't try this at home. Well, when it's time for Mangalarti, you can run out of your house. But Prabhupada said sometimes the gopis were in the middle of cooking and they left. They were breastfeeding their babies. Ah, oh, the flute! Put, put their baby down. Yeah. Don't try this at home. 
But we understand the principle. When Krishna plays his flute, how can you not go? This eagerness is required. We must be very, very eager to see Krishna. Many gopis were forcibly stopped from going to Krishna, and they lost their lives because of their great feelings of separation. So this eagerness is wanted. Then you can see God. Whether you are lusty or a thief or a murderer or whatever it may be, somehow or other, you must develop eagerness, this desire, I must see Krishna, then Krishna will be seen. Of course, for us as devotees, now, now some of you are thinking, maybe this is already in the questions, I, I sometimes kind, kind of can anticipate questions, and so some of you are thinking, but Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, don't try to see Krishna, but act in a way that Krishna will see you. And of course, that's true, and it appears that Srila Prabhupada is contradicting that statement. And Prabhupada has quoted Srila Bhakti Siddhanta saying that, so certainly Prabhupada is aware of that statement while he's saying this. So Prabhupada is talking about, I think when we say eagerness to see Krishna, Prabhupada means eagerness to serve. Eagerness to be pure, eagerness to be Krishna conscious. That's the idea. So in other words, there has to be eagerness because if there's not eagerness for Krishna, there's going to be eagerness for something because living entities, by nature, have desire. They're inspired to do something. They're enthusiastic to do something. So Prabhupada's saying, well, be eager to see Krishna. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll read the prayers of the Acharyas and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll show this eagerness that they have in their heart to meet Krishna, to see Krishna. So it's not bad. Sun has arisen in the sky. Now I have to close the blinds. Other I look I look like I have Lord Shiva Tila. Okay, we'll wait for the clouds to come. They're back. Hmm. Sun is rising there. I thought it rose there. I chant, chanted Gayatri that way. I should have chanted that way. Now, I remember. Okay. Before I look at your comments, we'll finish this verse. The first thing Krishna is looking for is how eager you are to see him. Krishna will respond. So we'll say eager. Yeah, Krishna, I want to. Yeah, a broad understanding of seeing Krishna. Certainly, I'm sure you all want to see Krishna. And that eagerness to be Krishna conscious has to be greater than eagerness for other things. That's the idea. Krishna will respond. If you are actually eager to see Krishna, whether you are lusty or you want to steal his garments, or some way or other you have become attracted to Krishna, then it is sure your efforts will be successful. You know, Bhagavatam says, gives the example. You know, Kamsa was Krishna conscious out of fear. The gopis out of lust. Shishupal out of envy. And their meditation on Krishna was very intense. You know, Kamsa was seeing Krishna everywhere thinking he's going to kill me. And Sishopal was always thinking of Krishna because he hated Krishna. And you, you, you think of people you hate, right? And the gopis just wanted to be with Krishna, so-called lust. So the Bhagavatam is, is elaborating on this point and saying, if you end up eager to see Krishna, even if it's for the wrong reason, it's still good because you're meditating on Krishna and you become purified by it. That's the idea. So again, that's for people who are coming to Krishna consciousness. All right, you know. Somehow or other, even if it's unfavorable, unfavorable way of thinking, at least you're thinking of Krishna 
you'll get purified. But when you want to practice bhakti, it has to be anukul. Anukul means favorable. It can't be unfavorable. But for non-devotees, unfavorable thinking of Krishna can bring them to Krishna. So then Rupa Goswami quotes a verse. And you may have heard this verse before. Smeran bhangi traya parichitam sachi vishtirna vishtim bamsi naish nyastha dhara kishalayam ujvalan chandakena govindakyam haritanum ita keshi Kirto pa kante. Try to think of what verse this is. It's a few words that were giving it away. Ma prekshishtas tava jadi sake bandu sange sti ranga. The idea, if you're from New York, idea, the idea is that one gopi is advising another gopi. Quote. My dear friend, there is this boy. His name is Govinda. He's standing on the bank of the Jamuna near Keshiga. Okay, we have to have music for this. We just we have to. It's, I can't read this without music. It's just it's not fair. We have to do it justice. Right? Dear friend, there is one boy, his name is Govinda, and he's standing on the bank of the Jamuna near Keshigat, and he is playing on his flute. He is so beautiful. Especially during this full moon night. If you have any intentions to enjoy in this material world with your children, husband, or other family members, then please do not go there. So why did the gopi say this? Why did she say, don't go there? Because if you want to enjoy the material world, if you still want to enjoy it, and you see that young boy, you're going to lose all your desire to enjoy this world. Sometimes I, I ask devotees, are you reluctant to chant pure japa with the fear, out of fear, that maybe you'll become so purified that you'll lose all your desire to enjoy this world. And I think the answer is, for some devotees, yes. They may not be conscious of it, but I think some devotees subconsciously are a little fearful of becoming Krishna conscious, or at least becoming too Krishna conscious, or becoming too Krishna conscious too fast. What if I become Krishna conscious? I won't want all these things. I won't be interested in all these things. I'll be a fanatic. That fear may be there, but uh, this is a beautiful verse. Bhangi Traya. Krishna always stands in a three curved, in a three curved way with his flute. This is Krishna's Tribhanga form, bending in three places. So one gopi says to the other, if you think that you'll enjoy your life more in this material world, then do not go see Krishna. Do not go there. The idea is that if you once see Krishna, 
then you'll forget all this nonsensical materialistic enjoyment. That is seeing Krishna. This is all one lecture. I want to keep reading. Then I'll take your questions, comments. When Dhruva Maharaj saw Krishna, he said, Samen kritar to smi bharam nayache. My dear Lord, I don't want anything else. Dhruva Maharaj went to see Krishna to get the kingdom of his father. And when he saw Krishna, Krishna offered, Now, whatever benediction you want, you take. And Dhruva said, My dear Lord, I no longer have any desire. So this is a, a famous example of, of this point we're discussing. Because Dhruva had a very strong desire. He wanted to become more powerful than his father. So this was a big desire. He wanted to actually have his own planet. That's a huge desire, right? And when he saw Krishna, Krishna said, okay, I'll fulfill that desire. And at that point he said, the desire is gone. Now that I see you, I'm completely satisfied. Whatever I could want, whatever I could desire by seeing you, it's fulfilled. You're so much better, more beautiful, more satisfying. So this is the classic example in Bhagavatam of this principle, that once you see Krishna, you become purified. So even your motive for seeing Krishna was wrong, once you see him, it becomes purified. So, if you're eager to see Krishna, regardless of whatever motive you have, somehow or other, due to your eagerness, you'll see Krishna. That is the only qualification. In another verse, Rupa Goswami says, Krishna Bhakti Rasa Bhavita Mati Kriyatam Jari Kutopi Labhyate. I have translated the words Krishna consciousness from Krishna Bhakti Rasa Bhavita. So here Rupa Goswami advises, if Krishna consciousness is available, please purchase it immediately. Don't delay. It is a very nice thing. So, um, uh, this, this verse goes on to use the word lolyam, which is, lolyam means greed in Sanskrit. And so, um, and Prabhupada says, if Krishna consciousness is available, please purchase it. Uh, like we say, beg, bar borrow, or steal. Um, so, the idea here is that to advance in Krishna consciousness, there has to be very, very strong desire, or in this case, the word lolyam, hankering, greed, to become an associate of Krishna, to become an eternal associate of Krishna, to serve Krishna in one of the four rasas, to follow in the footsteps of one of Krishna's dear devotees, to develop the mood and attitudes and feelings of that devotee. That's part of the process. That's called Raga Anuga Bhakti. So I think the significant point is, which I made before, is that eagerness is a sign of life. So it's, it's just a question of what we're going to be eager for. And we see that uh, when we're not Krishna conscious, we still become eager for things that aren't related to Krishna. So, uh, this is the real, the real import of this lecture, somehow or other. Develop this eagerness. And then, so you're, you ask, well, how do I develop it? I can't just pick it out of the sky. And it's true. And when you, of course, do all the practices of, of devotional service, and you get the association of someone who has that eagerness, you hear from a person about Krishna who has that eagerness, then that eagerness, it wears off on you. It's contagious. And then you develop it. And that becomes your qualification for developing Krishna consciousness on a much higher level. Like this is, I have to, it, it, eagerness means I have to have it. You know, if if you're practicing Krishna consciousness and you're thinking, well, you know, maybe in this life I'll be Krishna conscious. 
maybe in this life I won't. You know, I'm not that very Krishna conscious. I, I doubt I'll be Krishna conscious. You know, it's hard and I'm still conditioned. That doesn't work. It, it doesn't work for anything. Uh, you know, you know, I like to be a millionaire, but it's so much work and, you know, I'm, I'm really not that smart and I, I don't know if I could do it and, you know, I'm not even certain I really want to do it. And, uh, we can all understand you definitely are not going to be a millionaire. So if you have that attitude for Krishna conscious, well, you know, it's kind of hard and you can't expect me to be that eager now because everything I did in the past and, you know. So that's not what Prabhupada's talking about here. Prabhupada's talking about, basically Prabhupada's saying, it doesn't matter, somehow or other become eager. That's your qualification. And so, you know, we have to look at ourselves. Well, how eager am I to be Krishna conscious? Well, if I become Krishna conscious, it'll be nice, but I'm not going to do all these austerities to become Krishna conscious. Are you kidding me? You know, I mean, like if Krishna wants to be merciful on me and Mahaprabhu wants to bestow his mercy on me, then he will. But if he doesn't, then, you know, what can I do? You know, I'll just have to come back in the next life and, you know, maybe five lives. I don't know. Yeah, that's not good. That's not the attitude that Prabhupada's talking about here. Prabhupada's talking about here, I have to see Krishna somehow or other. I'm not qualified, whatever. I have to do it. And you know, that's how you become successful at anything. Hmm. Uh, what is that? Okay, let's read the paragraph over. Yes, Krishna consciousness is available. You can purchase it from this Krishna consciousness movement. Just line up over here. We'll sell you some Krishna conscious. And what is the price? It is such a nice thing. But you have to pay the price. What is that? Tatalolyam apimulyam ekalam. There, yeah, the next part of the verse comes up. Simply your eagerness. The, that is the price. You have to pay this price. Then you get Krishna immediately. Krishna is not poor. And the Krishna seller, the Krishna devotee, he's also not poor. He can distribute distribute Krishna free, and he's doing that. But you simply have to purchase by your eagerness. Wait a minute, I thought it was free. Well, it's more or less free. You just be eager and you get it. You know, hey, we're passing out. We're passing out free gold pens and everybody's running and you're putting your hand out. At least, you know, it's free, but you have to like be eager, you know, putting your hand in front of everyone's face. Crap. Sometimes... <laughs> Do that when Prabhupada is passing out for sadhana. You're so eager. You just knock devotees over on your way. Not, not really, but sort of. So yeah, it's free, but you have to be eager. Someone may say, oh, eagerness? I have eagerness. Ah, but it is not so easy. Janmakoti sukritar nalabhyate. This eagerness cannot be achieved even by executing pious activities for millions of births. If you simply go on performing pious activities, still this eagerness is not available. Okay. So, how do I get it? Stay tuned next week to find out. So this eagerness is a very important thing, but it can be awakened only by association of devotees. I jumped ahead of the lecture. Therefore, we are giving everyone a chance to invoke that eagerness. Then you'll see God face to face. And you all know. When you get in the association of devotees, your desire to be Krishna conscious goes up. The more advanced association you get, the more that desire goes up. So there's two more paragraphs, and then, I believe, yeah, and then we'll have some discussion. We'll look at your comments and questions. This life is meant for seeing Krishna. It is not meant for becoming dogs and hogs. Unfortunately, the whole modern civilization is training people to become dogs and hogs. Wow. That's a heavy statement. 
It is only this institution, this Krishna consciousness movement, that is teaching people how to see Krishna. It is so important. This is really interesting. We're doing a conference next week. Um, Bhakti Raisayana Maharaj, Sagar Maharaj, in conjunction with IFAST, which is IFAST International, which is Bhakti Tirtha Swami's organization, Institute for Applied Spiritual Technology, is working with the, another organization, an interfaith organization. And he asked for volunteers, so I volunteered. And, and one of the topics, not one of them, the topic, one of the topics that I'm dealing with is education. So there's going to be a this panel discussion. And um, why is education important? And what's it for? This is interesting here, right? We're teaching people how to see God. So what is the purpose of education? Teach people how to see God. Hmm. I should write that down so I don't forget. And you're saying, Prabhu, how could you forget that? It's so powerful. And Prabhupada said, Prabhupada said, to remember means to remember to write it down. So right now I'm remembering to write it down. You could write it down also if you want. Okay. Now I'm going to go read that again. I thought well, something Prabhupada said was quite interesting. You know, Prabhupada doesn't mince words. He says it like it is because that's the job of the guru. This life is meant for seeing Krishna. It is not meant for becoming dogs and hogs. So what does Prabhupada mean when he says it's not meant for becoming dogs and hogs? Well, it's simple to understand if you observe the behavior of hogs and dogs. He means it's meant for more than eating and sleeping, mating and defending. But if you don't do more than that, then Mahabharata says, Pashubi samana. Samana means equal, Pashubi means animal. So, you know, it's a heavy statement, but it is factual because you have to make a distinction between a human being and an animal. And so if if you if you've got the eating meeting eating eating meeting, that's a joke. That was a Freudian slip. E we don't say eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. The GBC say you know during their meetings eating, sleeping, meeting, and defending. Yeah. <laughs> we we sleep and then we go to meet and then we argue. <laughs> so if you're just eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, then pashubi samana. You and the animal, same. So, unfortunately, the whole modern civilization is training people to become dogs and hogs. This is how Prabhupada sees it. When he looks at the world, this is what he sees. When he looks at education, this is what he sees. It is only this institution, this Krishna consciousness movement, that is teaching people how to see Krishna. It is so important. You can imagine how Prabhupada must have said, it is only this institution, this Krishna consciousness movement, that is teaching people. How to see God. How to see Krishna. It is so important. When Prabhupada says things, so much emotion. That's heavy. Big universities. Excuse me, sir, what did you learn at this university? Oh, I learned how to become a hog. Excuse me, ma'am, what did you learn here? I learned how to become a dog. Now we're at the Varnashram College. And excuse me, sir, what did you learn? I learned how to see God. Hmm. A little bit of a difference there. Okay, one more paragraph. Tats chadadana munayo jnana bhairagya yuktaya. Sima Bhagavatam 1, 2, 12. By eagerness, you'll automati automatically be enriched with knowledge and detachment. Hmm, that's a good deal. Knowledge does not mean, now we have discovered this atomic bomb. That is not knowledge. What knowledge is that? People are already dying, and you have discovered something that will accelerate death. But we are giving knowledge to stop death. Oh, that's... I'm going to write that one down also. 
That is so funny, isn't it? And so true. You understand what Prabhupada's saying? He's saying, you know, you, you call this knowledge, people are dying, and you call this knowledge, you kill them faster, and that's knowledge. It's interesting, right? But we are giving knowledge to stop death. That is Krishna consciousness. That is knowledge. Jnana bhairagya yuktaya. And as soon as you get this knowledge, automatically you become detached from all this nonsensical material happiness. Hmm. Prabhupada hit, it on, hit the nail on the head. right? So when you have faith, when you have eagerness, the consequence is renunciation and knowledge. What is that knowledge? That knowledge is what you need to go back to Godhead, not the other knowledge, which is what you need to stay, either stay in this world or uh, perform functions that uh, don't help you spiritually. Okay. So I'm going to go back now and go to the top and see what you have said. Mm -hmm. Welcome to all of you. I Going to the top, I just have to, you know, check. You're all checking in with your Hari Bowls. Hari Bowl to all of you. Chaturmai says, my Gurmash, which is Kodama Kananaswami tells this story that he was with one servant of his on a plane. And next to them, there was a businessman. That devotee, out of a sudden, all of a sudden, just turned to that man and said, Say Hare Krishna. That man <laughs> was more than surprised. <laughs> Gurmash thought, I don't know him. But at the end, that man did say Hare Krishna. Yeah, all right. <laughs> this is what you do, Jyotimai. You get a mantra card, and you say, excuse me, sir, uh, I don't have my glasses. Could you read that for me and tell me what that says? I can't see it. And he says, I think it says, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari Hari. Oh, that's what it says. Thank you. Mm. Oh, okay. Thank you. Devotees are transcendentally um, compassionate. One time, we had stopped a red light and a man was waiting on the sidewalk. We rolled down the window. Excuse me, sir. Do you know where Goranga Avenue is? And he went, he went, Goranga Avenue? No, never heard of it. He uh, he lifted his hands up. We were, you know, we were like 20 years old, just goofing on people, transcendentally goofing on them. We had been doing Sankirtan all day, so we were like intoxicated. But we were blessing that man. And he said, Goranga? No, I don't know. Okay. That was the best thing that ever happened to that guy, I think. Okay. Kelly says, I first heard the Maha Mantra many years ago in the musical Hair. I wonder how many people who have performed in various productions over Hair over the years have become devotees. <laughs> well, if not this life, the next life. If not the next life, the one after. Anyway, they're in a good position to become devotees. Uh, Marco said, This verse spoken by a gopi to another is the introduction to the nectar of devotion. Yeah. This nectar of devotion is dangerous, Marco. If you read it, you might end up selling your guitar. If you actually imbibe it, you might end up selling everything. And moving in the Brahmacharya Ashram, very dangerous book. So Christe says, it was a yes in my case. I was afraid to start losing all the attachments, but Krishna does his thing. Yeah, here's how it works, Christe. 
First he takes away whatever you have, then he gives it back to you, but he gives you better things. So if you can tolerate that period of when he takes it away, and wait long enough, you'll get it back. He gives it back, he takes it away if you're not, if you can't use it, you're not ready for it, and then he gives it back when you're ready for it. So don't worry, just hang in there. It's all coming. There are many people today, this is from Kaylee, who are unfortunately very fond of the idea that humans are just animals and nothing more, and embrace the idea that biology explains the totality of life. So they have learned very well how to be hogs and dogs. Yeah, this is this is why Prabhupada established the Bhaktivedanta Institute to head-on challenge this idea. Because Prabhupada saw how insidious was the influence of this idea. You are just biology. And if you are just biology, there's no, and there's no next life, then there's no karmic reaction for what you do. So as long as you decide it's good, as long as you decide it's not going to hurt anybody, you do it. And I often say, you know, we don't have infinite knowledge to know whether what we're doing is hurting someone or not. There are also lots of microbes we hurt when we, when we walk, when we cook, lots of insects when we walk. So we do hurt entities we're not aware of. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of these people who say, well, if it doesn't hurt anybody, are not referring to animals, only human beings. And they hurt, a lot of animals are hurt for producing products, for meat eating, and so forth. So well, we that's it on your side, and we have still 26 minutes. So I'm going to go back and read. Mm. Mm. Well, he gives back, Christy's saying, oh, yeah, I finally understood it. He gives back when you're intelligent enough to know how to use it. More importantly, he gives back when you're detached enough to not misuse it. Maybe that's what you meant. Kind of a similar idea, maybe the same idea, but when you only want something for Krishna's service, then... He's happy to give you every all the resources you need. And if he ever sees that you have something that's an obstacle, he may he may remove it, or he just may make it very painful for you to misuse it. And then you understand by the pain that you're misusing it, and then you use it properly. That also happens. That happens a lot in relationships. You know, if you don't utilize relationships well, they become you suffer. And it forces you to learn how to have a proper relationship. Or, or anything you do, if you don't do it right, not anything, but often when you don't do something right, it causes pain. And then you're learning that you're not doing it right. That's the lesson. Because there's pain, you understand. Oh, I must be doing something wrong. I was going to say, you must be doing something wrong, right? But I don't want to confuse you, so I won't say that. Um, Nadia says, I'm a bit confused now. We're talking about eagerness and desire to become Krishna conscious, but a couple lectures ago you said first deserve, then desire. Yeah, it sounds like a contradiction. I know that I want some things in Krishna consciousness that... Definitely, it's a good question. They definitely don't deserve, and I'm not qualified to get. But now we read that we should have a strong desire to see Krishna. And what can be higher than that? So should I try literally to kill my desires in KC because I'm not qualified to, to get them and try to be satisfied with whatever Krishna gives to me? Or is it okay to have a strong desire to get something in Krishna consciousness? Well, it's a good question, and that statement that Prabhupada made first deserved then desire. It's a, it's a 
statement, like a common, what do you call that? Common knowledge, aphorism somewhere. As the saying goes, first deserve, then desire. That was in relation, directly in relation to hearing about Krishna's pastimes with the gopis, and, and particularly in relation to devotees who were only hearing those pastimes. So in that situation, Prabhupada was saying that we have Srimad Bhagavatam, 10 cantos, excuse me, 12 cantos, and you're just focusing on 10th canto, and in the 10th canto, you're just focusing on Ras Lila. Okay, that's fine if you're qualified, but you're not qualified for that. Are we qualified to hear Rasalila? Yes. Is, are we qualified to only hear that and nothing else? No. So we have to look at that statement a little bit within context. Now, what you say is true, that we do desire things maybe we're not qualified yet to achieve. And it, it is done often with this mood that I know I'm not qualified and I know I don't deserve it, but I want it. And the things we pray for are also the things we should want. It's not just that we want it, but we should want it, right? So now you look at the prayers of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, one of his songs, Kabe Habe Bolo Se Dinama. When will that day come when I will be running along the banks of the Ganges, exhibiting all ecstatic symptoms? So if you pray that way, Nadia, it really depends on what's going on inside of you when you pray. Like, yeah, that, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm about there. I'm, you know, I'm sure it's going to happen. Next time I go to Mayapur, I'm just going to be running on the Ganga. Ganga! And Nadia, you know, drowns in the Ganga. We never see her again. She fainted out of ecstasy. Definitely that's going to happen. No problem, you know. So if you're thinking like that, yeah, then that's not good. But if you're thinking, well, this is what I want someday. I'm not qualified, but Krishna, you know, when when will I be pure enough that when I say Goranga, all ecstatic symptoms will be there. If it's done soberly and with the, with the proper understanding, philosophically, and the proper mood, then it's okay. In fact, I find it's very powerful if while I'm chanting, I'm praying, Krishna, please, let me taste. Uh, let me taste something. Krishna, let me drop a tear. Let me experience something. But we're not saying it as a sahajya, thinking that I deserve it. The fact that I'm praying is I don't deserve it. That's why I'm praying. So prayer, prayer is always for the achievement of something you don't have. That's a stretch for you. You need help getting it. So as long as you're, gr you're grounded in the, in the understanding that this is what I want, Krishna, please help me. And knowing that Krishna will, if he's going to give it to me, he'll purify me so I will be able to receive it. He won't give it to me until I'm qualified. When will that day come when I run on the bank of the Ganges, half mad of mind, shouting the name Goranga, hair standing on end, voice choking? You can think that way. But while you're thinking that way, you're also thinking, when will I become qualified for that to happen? So that's part of your prayer. You understand that. So then it's okay. But if you're thinking, well, come on, Krishna, I'm qualified for this. Like, you know, what's going on here? Why are you holding out on me? Um, then you have a problem. So, th so the mood of the prayer is, I'm not qualified. And that's the, you know, that's why I'm praying, because I'm not. But I also understand I have to be somewhat qualified. And the other thing I think we could say, and probably some of you are thinking, is, well, maybe the prayer should be a little little closer to my adhikari, you know. Maybe I can just pray to get to Mayapur. Maybe I can just pray to be qualified to enter Mayapur. And then when I get there, maybe then I can pray to be 
we ha have the ast the sattva astika bhav, the eight symptoms of bhava. You know what I'm saying? So you might also consider that. But if you have a desire for a very high stage of devotional service and an eagerness for it, you can also pray and say, Krishna, I know I'm not qualified, but I pray somehow that you help me become qualified to have this to achieve this. So I find it really, really helpful in japa. Sometimes in japa retreats, I would ask devotees, well, if you could experience anything from the holy name, like just, you know, today's like a magic day. Mahaprabhu says, whatever you want to experience from the holy name today, I will let you experience it. What would you want to experience? So you think, well, I'd want to experience taste, specifically how uh, I would want to experience Krishna's presence in his name. I'd like to realize that Krishna's in his name, whatever it is. And so then I would say, that, so chant now, chant with that aspiration. Kobe hobe bolo se dinama. When or when will that day be mine? Hare Krishna. So you're chanting, Hare Krishna, this is my aspiration. I found that very, very purifying. And very, very helpful. Certainly better than chanting without any aspiration. What's your aspiration? I don't fall asleep, that I don't go crazy while I'm chanting 16 months. No, because if you don't have a higher aspiration, probably that aspiration enters the picture. You know, hope hope I can just get through these 16 rounds without, you know, just you know being really really bored or really really tired. Or, so, you know, that's not a very high aspiration. So certainly, you want to have high aspirations. And like I said, if your aspirations are really high, it could be bordering on sahajiya. But sahajiya is actually you're living as if you're on that level. That's the difference. So you might say, but maybe my aspiration is sahajiya-like because I'm not qualified. If you're not qualified and you know you're not qualified and you know what you need to do to become qualified, and you're praying, Krishna, I want to taste this. I want to have this experience, and please help me become qualified for it. Then I think you're good. So that's a good question, you know. So they may be naughty at the conclusion of the question is, whatever you pray for, pray to Krishna also to become qualified for that prayer to be fulfilled. Sometimes Prabhupada said, you, you can pray to your spiritual master, you pray to Prabhupada to help you pray for these things. So that's a good question. We still have time to read. Nadia, I, I found it quite amusing, the first line of your, like, I'm a bit confused now. Now? I thought you were always confused. I thought you were eternally confused. Nadia is confused, and then I answer her question, but then she'll definitely find something else to be confused about. But this was a good question. Yeah. Well, it's not bad if you're confused if the confusion brings you to a good question and a higher position. So this was a good question. I'm just joking with you. She knows. She lets me joke with her. She's probably laughing now. Yes, Guru Maharaj, my eternal constitutional position is to be confused. Anyway, we're, we're breaking through the clouds of confusion. Okay, so let's read a little more. So the next quote, oh, there's another. The next quote is from the Narada Bhakti Sutra. The gopis knew that Sri Krishna is the Supreme Person, but in their intimate rasa with him, they put aside the awe and reverence usually offered to the Supreme Lord. The Lord's internal potency, Yoga Maya, allows loving intimacy, loving intimacy to overshadow God's majesty. But this does not mean that pure devotees like the gopis lack spiritual advancement. 
except for the gopis Krishna brought with him from the spiritual world. All the gopis came to their position of Madhurya Rasa only after many lifetimes of austerity and spiritual cultivation. Regarding the cowherd boys, gopas, who play with Krishna, Srimad Bhagavatam states they attain their position only after accumulating heaps of pious activities in many lives. So although it may sometimes appear that the liberated devotees have forgotten that Lord Krishna is God, this is actually an arrangement by Yoga Maya for increasing the pleasure of the Lord and the devotees. So in other words, for so many lives they knew Krishna was God. And now they come into Leela and Maya, uh, Yoga Maya covers them in a way that they don't know Krishna is God because now they're qualified to know, to not know that Krishna is God because they've known he's God for so many lifetimes. And now they're qualified to not know because they're, because they're qualified to enter Leela. And to enter Braj Leela, you can't know. Actually, the gopis know, kind of. Sometimes you'll see the gopis talk about Krishna being God, but it's not like they really know. <laughs> or they immediately forget after they say that. So this, this continues. For example, as Vasudev carried his baby son Krishna across the Jamuna River, the baby fell into the river. Srila Prabhupada writes, quote, Just to test the intense love of Vasudev, Lord Krishna fell into the waters of the Jamuna. His father was crossing the river. Vasudev became mad after his child as he tried to recover him in the midst of the rising river. That's from Srimad Bhagavatam 3.2.17. Lord Krishna did not want Vasudev to think, quote, Oh, Krishna will save himself. He's God. But he wanted to evoke the paternal rasa in full intensity. In a similar way, Mother Jasoda sometimes expressed her maternal love for baby Krishna by punishing him. And when his mother came to punish him, Krishna reciprocated by running away in fear. Srila Prabhupada describes this apparent contradiction as follows. So this, this is a book Prabhupada started, but he didn't finish, and it was finished by some of his disciples, Narada Bhakti Sutra. But here is a, a purport from the first canto, 8th chapter, text 31. The Lord's pure devotee renders service unto the Lord out of unalloyed love only. And while discharging such devotional service, the pure devotee forgets the position of the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord also accepts the loving service of his devotees more relishably. Is that a word? Relishably? Look it up on Google. I don't, no, I'm going to look it up. I don't think it's a word. I think it's a word Prabhupada used or Bhakti Siddhanta. We have any English teachers here? Relish, um, what was the word? Relishably. Mm -mm. Let me see if I spelt it right. Relishably. Okay. Did you mean relishable? Hmm, I guess I did. Okay, let's see if relishable works. The Supreme Lord also accepts the loving service of his devotees. No. So it looks like either Prabhupada or his humble servants created a word which is perfectly good, and it must exist somewhere in some dictionary. The Supreme Lord also accepts the loving service of his devotees more relishably, in other words, with more relish, when the service is rendered spontaneously out of pure affection without any reverential admiration. If Mother Jasoda had been conscious of the exalted position of the Lord, she would certainly have hesitated to punish the Lord. Definitely true. But she was made to forget this situation because the Lord wanted to make a complete gesture, gest gesture of childishness 
That's somehow I can't speak today. Let's try that again. The Lord wanted to make a complete gesture of childishness before the affection, affection at Jasoda. Mother Jasoda is praised for her unique position of love, for she could control even the all-powerful Lord as her beloved child. Hare Krishna. So, um, I really like this point that was made before and Prabhupada made. So, as you know, if you know the story, when Vasudeva was bringing Krishna, he was crossing the Jamuna, it was quite stormy, and Krishna fell from his hands into the water, and Vasudeva was extremely worried, right? Extremely uh, anxious. And so now that that anxiety is just it's it's just a manifestation of affection and now that infection affection is increasing and Krishna's like, Yes, I like this. You know, so Krishna could have said, No problem, Father, you know I'm God, you know, don't worry about it. You forgot, you know, just like this is not a problem. I created the Jamuna, you know. She's not gonna cause me to drown. And um, but it, but this was an opportunity to increase affection. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've had an opportunity where you could do something and it would just increase affection. And sometimes we do that, right? Like you have a surprise party, you buy someone a present for no reason, or you're out somewhere and you just decide you want to do something special. So it's something like that. I mean, not exactly, but you get the idea. This was an opportunity where love could manifest more deeply. And Krishna, he, his whole, he exists for the sole purpose of manifesting love. So if Krishna has an opportunity to manifest love, you think he's going to skip a beat? No, how do we say it? He's not going to skip a beat. He's going to take advantage of that opportunity. So, you know, Krishna saw, well, here's an opportunity. I'll just cause Vasudev to drop me, and then he'll be so anxious it will... In, Increases love, and this will be a beautiful lila. Isn't that nice? You like that? But Vasudev knows that I'm God. There's no, there's no, it's not going to work. So Krishna takes all these opportunities to increase the love of his devotees, the affection of his devotees. So that's good. Isn't it? You like that? I think that's really nice and sweet. And it's relishably sweet. Okay, who I think it was Kaylee? You are you a you have an English background? Someone has an English background. It'd really be interesting. It would really be interesting to see if. I mean, it's published by B BBT. It has to be a, a a word, or maybe, or maybe I'm just trying to find out if relishably is an actual world word. Or they decided to create that word just, which doesn't sound like they would do that. Because that's, or not change it because Prabhupada used it and maybe it's ancient. It's It was used 100 years ago, 150 years, 200 years ago, 500 years. Was there English 500? Yeah, Shakespeare. Maybe Shakespeare used it. Maybe it's a Shakespearean word. I don't know. If someone wants to find that, I would just be interested. Okay, we have four minutes. You're all quite quiet today. Oh, a math background, yeah, okay. Someone has an English background. You see how well Nadia writes? She's Russian. I think she's better in English than I am. That's interesting. Either she's a genius or I'm not. But her English is really good. Okay, math. Right. Kayla, you know what Prabhupada said when Devotee had a PhD in math. But he said, Prabhupada, how can I use my math background? I don't know if I told you this story. How can I use my math background? Prabhupada said, you can calculate how long you've been in the material world. He was joking. <laughs> Seriously joking. How do I use my math skills, Prabhupada? Calculate how long you've been in the material world. It, that's you know why that's also funny, because the shastra says we've been here from time immemorial, and the reason it is said time immemorial is because you can't calculate it. So Prabhupada's saying calculate with your math, and he said, but you can't. There's not. 
It's not, you don't know how long you've been here. We don't know. It's too long. There's no number for it. Uh, Tanya, I think she's quoting me. Krishna exists for the sole purpose of manifesting love. So wonderful, yeah. I should write that down so I don't forget it. Chris, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. I'll, I probably will remember it. Maybe I'll do a daily video and we'll tell this story. It's such a nice story, isn't it? Now, Tanya, why do you exist? You're supposed to exist for the sole purpose of enhancing Krishna's love. Yeah. Linguistically, relishably is a perfectly good word. And I'm I'm always for creating your own words, like like Shakespeare did it. So good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Like why not? And sometimes when you're translating Sanskrit, you kind of have to fool around a bit. In Sanskrit, there's also Eng Anglicized Sanskrit words, like uh, karmic. You know, karma is a Sanskrit word, but karmic is an English word. Well, that's just karmic consequence. Because you can't say that's a, you could say that's a consequence of karma, but it's sometimes easier to say karmic consequence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, Christy said she's taking a break today and not asking a million questions. Um, oh wow. So by my Nadia is saying by my transcendental shakti, she's able to speak English. So can you do that same shakti on me so I can speak Russian? Ruski. Spasibo. Harosho. Da Pravda. Some Russian words are really difficult for me to pronounce, but Nadia will bestow her mercy on me. And on Tomorrow, I will give class in Russian. There will be no need for translation. Okay, Nadia, let's see if you can do it. I'm, I'm sure someday, right, there'll be a chip or there'll be some system you hook your brain up to a computer and just... Ah, oh, that day's coming. You know, School is not necessary. You know, in 10 seconds, you get the right chips and you're like, you know everything. You make, look, you make Albert Einstein look like a, a fool. Your IQ will be like 7,800. You're connected, you know, to the universe through a chip. When that day comes, I hope I've gone back to Godhead already. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I think we made a good point today. Well, we made two good points about how we should be eager to see Krishna will become purified, and then we should pray to be eager, but not be sahajiya understanding, um, you know. If you understand you're not qualified for what you're praying for, but you're hankering for it, and you're willing to do the tapasya to get it, then that's perfect. Um, so, okay. <laughs> okay, Christe, ask your question. Nadia is saying, my Russian is perfect, so now Nadia's off the hook. She doesn't have to transmit any any more words to me? I thought I was you going to like telepathically like transmit Russian to me. I was looking forward to it. Okay, Christe, ask your question, then we'll go. We're going to have. Um, I think it's at two o'clock. I could be wrong, but at two o'clock today, which may you know, it's still okay time for most of you. Except if you're in India, we're going to have a class on um, supportive community. I think it'll be interesting if you want to come. It should be advertised. It's going to be translated into Italian. The other day I read that Prabhupada didn't like when devotees would note down things in classes when he gives a lecture because unless they can write down every single word of his, is it true? I need to note things down. Um, I know he had one devotee who wanted service and Prabhupada said, take notes on my class. 
but I think I think sometimes Prabhupada meant, you know, just here. I think he thought that maybe they weren't concentrating when they were taking notes. He just wanted them to hear. Is it, so, Jyotir, my, I have written down in my calendar 2 o'clock, but according to me, that would be like 8 p.m. in Italy. Is that right? It seems so late to start a class. Yeah, The Bond of Love. You're reading The Bond of Love, right? Christie's, there's this book called The Bond of Love, and it's Memories of Prabhupada from His Female Disciples. Yeah, I read about half that book with my daughter. It's really good. So now I just need to know from Jyotir Termai. She's calculating. Do you know what time it starts in Italy, Jyotir Termai? Perfect. Okay, so um, it's going to be it's going to be two p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That would be eight p.m. in Italy, right? Uh, it's going to be. An, I think it'll be an interesting class for you know for helping us all work together. Okay, so we'll end class now. Thank you, Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Kije, Go Premanandi, Hari Hari.